Yeah. What kind of modifications would you use? Are the modifications on the protein itself, like choose a protein that you would want to use to import? Mm -hmm. And then what modifications would you do to the protein? Uh, you can just imagine a protein in, in like an abstract concept, right? Like let's say, um, <coughs> whatever. Um, um, A L M A B E B E L. All right. Let's say that's your your random protein that, that we're working with, and it's like if you weren't wanted to add something to it, right? And it's like, hey, I want to make sure this protein goes into the nucleus. What would I do to it? That's the question. Okay. Like, what, what would you do?
All right, guys, one more minute. Finish them up, and then let's go. For the second one, do you just mean like physically, mm -hmm. like the change, how it, or like is there an interaction? Does anyone argue? Well, I'm going to start the class and then um, what we do at the end, right before we go, I want to talk about the text, make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. All right, let's do this. So today we're still on the same topic. It's about we're doing um, basically transport, right? So we're going to be focused on the uh, vesicular transport. Remember, for this, it's like my really rough analogy is like these are little fat bubbles, right? These little fat bubbles, they can basically capture things inside of them and we can move them forward. And today, we're going to get into some really cool stuff about the fact that these things are actually controlled by the other organisms to regulate them. Right? And with that being said, it's like there's going to be some of them can regulate to the point of they can take what they're picking up, while others, there's a case where um, they can just randomly grab and they build up a, a, like a, a random pool of water and they can go drop it off from the flat level point. The other part is we're going to see how also the that fat bubble itself, there's mechanisms that determine how and when we create it like to give it its shape. Um, those are pretty cool. So the, the class and code stuff. And we're also going to talk about once you've made that bubble, it moves to the environment you want to get to. It actually has a way to regulate to make sure that it's in the sense of the right compartment. And it's going to match up with that plasma membrane. You'll squeeze and dump the constant only into that one. It won't bump into the wrong organelle. It can accidentally drop off the wrong thing. Oh, guys, I feel cool right now. All right, so let's get into it, right? So, again, let's orient ourselves. Let's see what we're at in the big storyline. So, um, for the most part, this drawing, I like to be really organized because, you know, I'm a nucleus guy first. So I'm always thinking of all my stories start with nucleus, right? Nucleus, you guys remember, has the DNA. You know, that's where we make our RNA. But then it goes into the cytoplasm, right? Once the RNA is in the cytoplasm, the only story that we follow is it ends up going to the ER. But this is just a molecule floating through the cytoplasm. Once we get here, um, last week's stuff is what we talked about. This person can have set special signals. Remember, it traps it through that signal, brings it to the ER, and then it, um, it, the, the, the ribosome is only making the protein, it's actually dumping it into the compartment itself. Right? If you imagine this would be the ER, we're sitting making the protein on the inside of the ER. At which point, I, I want you guys to think of uh, like the cytoplasm to think of content that's outside of our, our small vesicles or our fat bubbles. Like proteins that go through the, through the so the ER are not going to be those proteins that we find inside of that. And those are the ones that we have control over. We can send them where we want, and we can send them to a specific address. Um, once you get there, now I want you guys to see, boom, now we jump to everything down here is that vesicular transport, which again is now everything's moving to the top. We can send stuff from the Golgi. We can send it to secretory vesicles. And that's one way that we can just dump stuff out of the cell. Kind of like this, right? There are molecules you want to dump out. You want to transcend the Golgi, put them into a fat bubble, send them out to the plasma membrane, and we can dip them out. Right? Whatever proteins you want. Um, other ones, we can kind of have them go through different pathways. Like some of them are being like these uh, permeate endosomes. They're basically the places where we're going to start preparing the material on the inside when we're going to send it to the lysosome. And remember, this is that big. Specialized fat bubble where we cook things or we eat things, protein, um, lipids, sugars, we're going to eat, I guess they're going to go. But all of these, we're going to talk about today how they have specific, special mechanisms to bring specific targets and send them to a specific compartment. Um, so, all of the blue arrows, it's only a one sided arrow. So, does that mean it can't go back to the side at all? Like, will it ever just be released? So, right here, let me 
there, there is stuff you can send back. I think I can remember there's some monitors from the ER that regulate how they mess with your um, with your um, with your DNA. So I know they can send stuff back. But for the most part, I would say just stick with our now like it's moving one way. But really the important thing is is to think about the mechanism itself, right? So it's like in case of the nucleus, remember there, the big player is the nuclear pore complex. Remember, that's the one that looks like a little basket and it, it has little arms that can craft stuff. So, it integrated into the nucleus. Um, I'll get you a picture of it. It looks freaking cool. It's like a little basket with a bunch of arms. And that's really grass. They can carry the main. There's other persons that they get recognized on the inside of the nucleus. They grab them, they can basically throw them out to that floor. That one is special because it has a double membrane, but you're controlling it for that one. The, the ER, normally there, it's because we're just thinking about how the RNA is going to get our protein into the cell or across the transplant membrane. So, um, if I remember correctly, it was like when we're sending the transcription back to back, it's like the ER is sending that thing. You can't send vesicles to the nucleus because this is a double membrane, right? So, it's like even if you make it and you bubble it, you try throwing it back, it would basically land on the outside of the nucleus, you know? Um, so feel comfortable with the mechanisms and just know that from the ER down, that's supposed to be big player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. All right. So you guys are doing pretty good. We're going to be talking about vesicles today. All right. So part of this, we're going to be thinking about two different things, and this is basically describing up where this vesicle is coming from. Right. So for this one, we have exocytosis. And um, endocytosis, right? So it's like, um, I, have, I wrote them up. Yeah. So here's where we're taking exocytosis, we're taking stuff out. Endocytosis, basically, we're doing stuff in. Right? But we're doing the same thing where it's like, in one case, we're getting the plasma membrane from the fat bubbles basically merge with the plasma membrane of the whole cell. And that's how we can dump out the things inside. Or the other case is that we can, like, in other words, like endogenate, but basically fold in the plasma membrane, catch particles, and then as you make it, travel will come in and you have content trapped inside of it. All right, so there's different types for the endocytosis. This kind of tells you, like, basically what we're eating, right? So, cytocytosis is the one like our immune system does this. Well, basically, any bacteria or any um, oral cells or cells that have popped or lice, we can eat those. Um, Phenocytosis is um, basically you just bring in liquids. So in this case, it's like because of this, it's not as um, picky, right? It's just making a fat bubble, whatever cell we're basically grabbing it, and you're bringing it onto the inside. So this one kind of helps us here in the GI because normally there, your GI is super full of sugar, nutrients, and stuff. So you really don't have to be picky. You can just grab everything, bring it in, and figure out what you're going to eat. Um, Opposite to that, we'll get to the this one's called receptor mediated. In this case, the vesicle itself, you can see it has little, um, I can't remember if they're integral proteins or, or peripheral proteins, but what they do is they have an affinity for your specific target that you're trying to bring in. So that means that because they have that secret handshake, <coughs> they turn a receptor, but basically like sticky ends to hold on to whatever molecule you want. On. So even if it's at low concentration in the solution, you'll be able to grab enough of them when you actually start to build up and feel like you have a high concentration, right? And that's you get that nice enrichment of the molecule and you boom, you can bring it in. All right, so for exocytosis, again, now we're kicking stuff out. Same thing. Um, so in one case, here we're looking at the Golgi, right? We're at the uh, trans site, we're trying to throw things out. This can be either the content or it can even be the plasma membrane itself. But this is just consist consistently happening, right? So they'll start constitu constitutive, which just means it just keeps going, keeps going. It's not regulated, opposite to this guy. When it's regulated, there's some other signal that basically determines when we do this, this dump of the content, right? So that plasma membrane could be being held up. It could serve as a signaling molecule. Like the green little beads could be like an enriched signaling molecule. And once the receptor comes in, gives the signal, it goes out there and now it can dump the content. Now that molecule can diffuse. If it's 
short distance, long distance, but now you've released it into the actual um, extracellular space. And now it can diffuse away from you. And then the other one is um, the lysosome. So again, before I was talking about when you have vesicles, they basically trap proteins for a little bit. If you send them to the lysosome, there we have a low pH and a bunch of eaters, right? Again, RNA, DNA, sugar, fats, uh, phospholipids. Um, those proteins get activated by the low pH and they'll start to eat stuff. They normally start breaking it down. And it's kind of like, once it's breaking down everything it can, you can actually dump it, dump it out. Like it's like the waste from what you don't need anymore, right? As this is doing the, that cooking or eating, what's happening is within that plasma membrane, they have special channels or they have transporters. The third job is that as you're cutting smaller, like the sugar molecules to smaller molecules, or you're cutting the DNTPs into smaller chunks, you actually diffuse them back into the cytoplasm, right? And that's how we're putting out all the good stuff. Whatever you don't end up digesting, nobody has to stuff you like. It's going to be complete waste, and that's what you can do for that. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to talk about how is it that we can make that fat bubble to actually deform the plasma membrane, grab itself, so we can basically start to separate from the other thing. This is what we're going to be talking about, basically three different coproteins, right? You have coprotein one. This one I want you guys to be thinking about that it's normally used from the trans side and it has a direction, right? Like that'll go from the trans side and it gets to see to the ER, right? When we look at um, uh, coprotein two, you can see that goes from the ER, gets us into the Golgi, and then clathrin is the one that gets us from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, and it can also get us back. Yeah, so if I tell you that I'm having issues with like building up a protein in a certain compartment, you should be able to get maybe a guess of which one of these molecules I've broken in the system to have that effect happen. Yeah. But all of these are going to be working in the same um, in the same general way, which is I remember years ago I read one of these papers, right? And it was pretty cool because it was um it was showing that let's say the red thing is the thing that we're trying to capture, right? That's the molecule you want to enrich. We had a transmembrane receptors, so it means that that molecule is sitting on the plasma membrane and it's enriched in a spot. And it's kind of waiting to grab onto something, right? If it's there, it grabs onto it. As it does that, it changes its exterior conformation, right? So now it's like, because it's grabbed on, the change, there's a change in the conformation on this side. And then that part hitting the cytoplasm is the one that ended up doing, um, stabilizing the interaction for those little cop proteins, the co right? So as you had, like imagine they would have been a neighborhood, right? If the three of them are receptors, they're not bound to anything, they're being a straight line. The moment you see the three of them started binding to, to their internal things, the clathrin becomes more stable in the back and it would like basically start pushing her inward and it would start pushing her inward, right? And that would start giving us a little bit of deformation. As the next receptor got activated, same thing, change her conformation, clathrin shows up, it builds that mesh and it pushes her even further in this way, right? And as you can see, the further out I get, the more we, the more she bends, she's going to bend her, she'll bend her, and she'll bend her. And it'll start folding it in. If you only have a little bit of ligand and you only activate one person, right? You don't have any force to make you bend in. So it waits until it builds up where enough receptors have been activated, aka you have enough of the molecule, and then it makes the bubble. And that's where all three of these kind of use, use this little same shape, which are these guys. So the receptor will basically work with these guys. This is your, 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 your co-protein. Um, I kind of imagine them, they'd be like on the side facing the plasma membrane, they're kind of shaped like this, right? So they have three sides, but they're kind of aimed inwards into the thing like that. That way, when they start interacting with each other, you can see the red one with the dark red and the green, their arms clamp into each other. As they're doing that, that's what's giving us that push or that mechanism. And you can see, literally see the vesicles start to kind of, it builds the mesh, builds the mesh, pulls the plasma membrane until we build the whole sphere around it. Right? And that's literally is the mechanism to tighten up that fat bubble. And it only does it if the receptors are activated. So it's kind of like, it's a really clean mechanism, right? Like perfect for a midterm question or a quiz question. Um, 
So story wise, right? We have the carbo protein. That's the thing that we're trying to kick out. So whatever the story is, I'm trying to send it to the Golgi. Right? If I'm from the Golgi, trying to send it to the plasma membrane, or if I'm trying to bring something back, this is the molecule that we're going to invest our energy to move it. Then we have the receptor. Again, big keywords here are it's a transmembrane receptor. It binds to the carbo very well. That's what gives us the affinity, right? The internal receptor has that secret handshake where it's only going to grab the molecule you want. It's not going to get activated by other things. After that, you have your adapter proteins. That's the one that's going to bind to that receptor. And then you have the, um, the keratin, right? This is one of the co-proteins, which basically binds to that. And again, with my rough analogy, that'd be the example of their receptors. The next row would basically link up with them. Finally, the closer platform would be on the outside. And they're the ones that are going to push the group together. Yeah. All right. Now that you've made your fat bubble, that for sure has enriched molecules that you care about. Then here comes the big players, right? You have your microtubule network set up, and you have two molecules you can play with. What were the two molecules or motor proteins that we have for the microtubule? Remember? Remember one of them is kind, kind, very kind. And these say, yeah. And then what's the other one? Whoops. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? So those are going to be able to move us towards the micro, toward the plus end of the microtubules or away from the minus end. Tonight's assignment is to think about what do you guys know about the microtubules? You guys, you know, I've had a drawing before where I'm like, hey, this is your cell. We're not going to cell division. And you have your microtubule network set up like this. Right? My question to you guys is, what do we have here? Plus end or minus end, right? What's here and what's there? That's the first level. Next question is, you have your kinase end and your dying end. These work two different ways, right? This one, does it go towards the positive end or does it go to the negative end? Right. This will tell us what's the network that we have what molecule we need to connect it with to send it to what environment, right? The thing I want you to connect it with today is if we're moving something, right? Let's say from the ER, we're trying to send it to the Golgi, you know we have to use COP2, right? So that was the question, right? ER to the Golgi, what's the arrangement of the microtubules? Which one of these two molecules would you use? And in this case, right, we have to use co protein too. Does that make sense? Wait. Microtubule, like, is the inside not um, negative and outside positive? No comment. <laughs> that's that's, that's, not, that's what you guys got to chase down. Why don't you go through your notes and get them out? So no um, comment. I'm sorry, what's the question? If we're trying to get our carbo protein, we're trying to grab something and we're trying to get it from the ER and we're trying to move it to the gold. Right? Your microtubules are part of your network, right? That's the thing that's going to help you carry them. They have a specific arrangement inside the cell. One side is plus my plus in, one is a minus in. I get no comment which one's which. You got to figure out how it's set up for a cell not divided. On the next part, again, if we're going from, let's say the nucleus and your, your ER is right here, and you're like, hey, we're trying to send it to, to this part of the ER, or sorry, ER to Golgi, here, and our Golgi's out here like that. Right. What, because of the arrangement of the microtubules, which one of the two molecules are gonna be in, right? Kinesin or dynamin? One of them goes to the positive, or one goes towards the minus, right? Tell me which one you need. And third would be connected to the co, uh, co protein that you need to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Wait, it's, what are the two proteins? Kind of center. I feel like I'm saying it wrong. No, no, no. And what else? You said two? The two? There's two options. Um, yeah, dy dynamin and. Mm -hmm. One. And. 
Magnesium? I forget. Sorry, guys, I slept like four hours last night. My brain is. Yeah, kind of easy. And then I was about to give away the answer. Mm -hmm. No comment. But there's two of them, right? You need to figure out which one goes towards the positive end, which one goes towards the minus end. So, ooh, that's a good question. I like this one. Let's say I was talking about we're trying to move stuff between the Golgi and the plasma membrane. Mm -hmm. right? What molecule would you use to make your vesicle itself? Yeah, the plasma membrane. So that same molecule just makes the bubble to bring new things out or to bring them in, right? which is opposite from the earlier stuff. Right here, we switch between COP1 and COP2 to make this happen. So down here, it's if you want something to go from this to get outside of the cell. You basically interact with one of these molecules. Right? If you want to go in the opposite direction, you jump over and move the other one, and that'll get you back. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah? This feels like a really good quiz question to put one of those like multi part ones. So, what was the third part of that question? COP2. What about COP2? So, COP2. So, right now, for the vesicle transport, it's free game where I can ask you if stuff is moving from one compartment to the other, right? If I say, hey, I want to see stuff that's moving from the ER to the Golgi in that direction, what cop do you use? Two. Right? But if I want to send stuff back, cop one. Yeah. And then if I tell you, hey, I want to get stuff from the plasma membrane to like the endosome. Um, cop two. <laughs> oh, well, from ER to Golgi and that's. Sorry about that. Oh, plasma membrane to the endosome. Clathrin. Clathrin, right? So, in order to get the system to work, to move from here to here, you have to make a combination of these things, right? So if I said plasma membrane to endosome, switch out the cop, and you make a class, right? Do you need a kinesin, or do you need to switch dynamic to move it, right? And you tell me how the microtubules are set up. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes. Seems like a fun question, guys. I'm kind of pumped up to write that one. All right. Um, so this is a, this is the slide. It's kind of like I was trying to figure out what analogy to use. And I really like the, the class setup because I'm like, we have rolly chairs, right? So I was like, hey, if we act it out in class, it'll help you remember it, right? But this is kind of what I was talking about, right? So this is basically the pathway, and it's like, I like it because it seems so cool that it's super efficient at whatever you want to grab onto, get a go to it, grab it, and then we make sure that every single molecule is helping out grabbing onto this, right? So here, focus on the receptor. And what you're seeing is this is the one that's sitting on the plasma membrane. And this is the thing that we want to carry. Right? And here's what I was saying. Every receptor is binding to one of these molecules. This is the interaction that helps us get into this, which is getting the clathrin to create. Right? And I mean, the clathrin is that force that pushes them together. So if it was like, and then if I was messing around with the front row, I'd be like, if she's activated as a receptor, if she's activated as a receptor, she would get pulled this way. Right? So it'd be like her guest would get closer and uh, Annie's guest would get closer. The moment the next receptor gets, gets activated, it's doing the same thing. Instead of being flat, it's going to get pushed into itself. So it's like you're kind of coding the class into itself, and that would basically give you the bubble. Does that make sense? So super efficient. For your notes, just remember one of my favorite questions to ask here is because where do you find the classroom? And where do you find the person that you're the car that you're trying to carry out? Right. So feel comfortable with that relative orientation. But at that point, it's like Every molecule you're seeing here, like this little chain, the chains are built up six different clathrins connecting to each other, right? Each one of those is holding onto a receptor, which is holding onto one of your molecules. So to build this whole shape, right, you have a super enrichment of that cargo protein. So even in an environment that doesn't have enough of it, this thing will act like a sticky trap, just grabbing more and more and more until eventually it comes it off. Um, and then you can actually pinch off the neck 
There's another group of proteins um, that help basically cut that off. And then um, when it does that, that final push and it squeezes, the plasma membrane will collapse on itself. And then the hydrophobic pockets will kind of sit fine with each other on this side. And they'll do the same on the inside plasma membrane. And it'll seal right back up. Known as a triskelion, a three legged structure made up of three heavy chains and three light chains. Extended interleg contacts between different triskelions allow clathrin to self assemble into regular lattices. Adaptive protein complexes are able to simultaneously bind to clathrin, membrane lipids, and membrane bound receptor proteins, and thereby direct the assembly of a clathrin coat around cargo that is destined for internalization. The binding site for transmembrane receptor proteins is only accessible, however, after a conformational change that appears to be stabilized by binding to clathrin and membrane lipids. Clathrin cage disassembly is mediated by HSC70 and its cofactor, oxillin. Oxillin binds to the clathrin lattice near vertex points where three triskelion legs meet and recruits HSC70 to this site, leading to the rapid disassembly of the clathrin cage. Each vertex region can bind up to three oxillins and just one HSC70. Within the cage, about half of the vertices are estimated to be bound to HSC70. The actin cytoskeleton can play a key role in clathrin mediated endocytosis. Actin filaments are recruited to the growing clathrin lattice by interactions with HIP1R, which binds to the light chain of the clathrin triskelion. Portactin is released from HIP1R and triggers the polymerization of branched actin through the activation of ARP23. ARP23 is further activated by membrane bound GTPases such as ARP6. This actin network is of critical importance when clathrin coat assembly is stalled due to high membrane tension or by internalization of very large cargo. In these cases, all right. So this, this this graphic looks pretty nice. I like it. All right. So you see there, the receptors are starting to bind. We're starting to build the coat, and you can see it, it's the mechanics of these cables are the ones that are causing causing that fold infolding to happen, right? That kind of makes sense. Like it brings it in there. This was going to have trouble because it's not going to be able to make it a perfect sphere. Because again, the, the clathrin, like my rough analogy is like it's like this, and then they're folded in like that, right? We can't put any more into this because otherwise it's going to be able to want to keep making a curve towards the inside. Since it's not going to be able to make the sphere, that's where you support it with the acting. But I'm not going to go heavy into that. I'd rather stick at this level. So feel comfortable with this first part about how we're building that shell to trap that, 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 that the, the cosmic membrane to give it that sphere shape. All right. Now we've made the bubble, we've, we've tied it up, we've pinched it, and we started moving it with our molecules, and we're sending it to the place it needs to go. Right. So at that point, it's we have a very stable plasma membrane. Hydrophobic parts on the outside, sorry, hydrophilic parts on the outside, hydrophobic core. Trying to open this or put it into the water is not going to want to have them kind of bump into each other and merge. And this is where we're going to have some really key players that at the other side, they're going to make sure we're at the right compartment. And when we do so, they're going to put a lot of mechanical force to make these two plasma membranes come together till they be with each other. All right, so for this one, V snares and T snares. Um, so V snares are the ones that are going to be sitting um, on the plasma, sorry, through the plasma membrane. They'll be on the vesicle, and then the T snares are basically um, these are on the target place, right? So it'll be like ER Golgi. Then have that specific T snare. These two make sets basically, right? So your vesicle has a V snare. The compartment you're going to have its T snare. They wrap into each other. But we have different types of B and, B and T snares, which are specific to each compartment. So that's one where we can say we're going to send it to a specific thing. Um, and then we're going to go a little bit into like the little mechanics behind it. Um, so here we go. <coughs> All right, so 
We have our, our fat level, our rosin side, everything's good to go. There's our V snare, right, coming in with our vesicle. And here's our T snare, our T, uh, T snare, which is our tethering. I remember it because I like target, but this is the proper so T snare there, and these are the tethering ones. So RAM GTP and this RAM GTP effector are like that first level of like selection, right? These two have, again, those protein-protein interactions that are specific to each other. We have found these, these different organelles have different sets of these um, rabbit factors and these uh, tethering proteins that help to bring them to the right apartment where these interact with are in the right place. Then we have these. There's your B-SNAN and T-SNAN. These are the ones that they actually start, like they have this high affinity and they'll coil into each other. When this thing has covered them, and normally has more than just one, it has like some on this side, some on this side. So as it grabs it, like almost like a, like a hot air balloon with the rose on all the sides, this thing is wrapped around all the sides. And when it grabs onto more of the anchored side, as it's coiling, that coiling force is what pushes this vesicle into the plasma membrane. To the point where you squeeze, like it squeezes it so tight that the little phospholipids that were kind of hanging around there, hydrophilic to hydrophilic side, they basically get pumped out. And once they get pumped out, you make a hydrophobic core, and boom, you can dunk, like split it open to get the, the content to come out. Right? So these are the big mechanical factors. Let me see how it looks like. So this is like once they're done, well, you can reset them. Like you own coil them, you can send them back. Let me see. I didn't put the slide on it. Um, but basically, you can reset this. <coughs> This thing will reset, your effector gets reset. These get, get like, they fall apart, and then you send some of them back to the original compartment. And then um, you can basically send it back useless. It grabs and it grabs, jumps onto a new vesicle, comes towards where you drop it off, drops the content, and it keeps going back. Um, so this one is just a little bit. Different. So when we talk about lipoproteins, um, this is like a special kind of vesicle. And the big difference is this is an actual uh, what's it called um, um, fat bubble. So you have the, the phospholipids on the outside, hydrophobic core on the inside, and then you actually see you can see have more things like cholesterol and triglycerides, and that's actually like solid of fat. All the ones I've been talking about before, it's double-sided plasma membranes. I don't know how it's in it, but there's a phospholipid bilayer. It's a phospholipid bilayer. You can see this is a phospholipid monolayer, right? So inside we have basically a hydrophobic core. In this case, uh, this is where you're storing high amounts of fat inside of that. And this is, I don't know if you guys have heard of these in the you know, work. They talk about your LDL and your HDL. And it just talks about the different types of fat that you have and then like you know, the fat bubbles that uh, build up in your arteries, basically. Um, so normally when you're moving these particles around, um, for this one, on the inside, it's like, um, it behaves way differently, right? So now this thing doesn't like hydro hydrophilic proteins. They're not gonna be stable in this environment. Proteins that are like properly folded, they hide your hydrophobic cores. If you put proteins into these things, your proteins are gonna flip inside out because they're gonna be in a hydrophobic environment and they're gonna flip all the content inside out. So it really messes things up. Um, but the mechanism for this, I want you to be thinking about the same things, the general thing, which is we're gonna be grabbing um, the extracellular part of the, of the fat bubble. We have the tissue it's going to. We have receptors to help recognize it. And part of that process is helping to bring it into it. Um, so these when we degrade them, the thing is that they go into the lysosome, and as it's doing the shredding, we're basically going to shred that phospholipid bilayer, right? Get rid of the phosphate, that when you have a hydrophobic core, then you get your other enzymes run through it, cutting everything you have inside. All right. Um, for the, this lipid lipoprotein, I'm not going to go that much into them. I already told you exactly where I'm coming at for you guys, right? Are pretty comfortable with this? So I would look at the way that this works. Make sure you feel comfortable drawing. Yes, sir. So, like, when you have like an excess buildup of like that LDL fat that like, causes like yeah. heart blockages and stuff like that, how do like 
pills before that, how do those counteract the um, like the building up of the LDR? Or like how, how does that help like break it break it up and like move it out of the system? Yeah, it's like it's like the the open up more and that helps like the fact that Kind of helps break it up. Right. Right. I don't know. That's why you have to be careful, especially like older people have to be careful. It's more careful. Yeah, because I was jumping between 11 and 14. Yeah. Um, there, I think 11, it's, it's, it's the place where we have the um, vesicle formation. Mm -hmm. Vesicle formation. I think 14 at the end is where we have the... Um, the transport of large molecules? Yeah. Okay, because I was kind of looking like at your lecture mm -hmm. and then like, Mm -hmm. So I kind of found the right chapters, yeah. but I wasn't sure. Yeah, let me double check. I remember it's jumpy. Like I was, doing, I was trying to go for myself, and I was going back and forth. Okay. Um, Thank you. No um, when do we have the exam? I'm gonna double check. I think I put Saturday on the syllabus, but I think it's Sunday. Oh, okay. Sunday? Yeah. Oh. Let me see. Exam. No final exams. So, um, I'm not sure we don't really pick up our way, has it? Yeah, you base it off when we have 